and we've come to talk to you today about the possibility of reintroducing beavers in parts of Britain that currently don't have them. This talk, as you can see, is about transforming nature restoration and why we need beaver wetlands and how to live with them. Um, incidentally, we're not saying they should be everywhere. It's more that they should be part of our toolbox. Um, an introduction to me, I'm a archaeologist uh, originally. And in fact, my first encounter was with, with beavers was excavating the what it became the Eton or Olympic Rowing Lake in 1994. I came across a beaver dam, a Bronze Age dam whilst excavation and uh, have been in love with beavers ever since. We are a small charity that was set up in 2019 and we've been set up to not, as it sounds, be a single species charity, uh, but to work across wetlands and river restoration with the beaver as a, as I mentioned, a tool in our toolbox rather than a single way of solving problems. Uh, we are driven very passionately by the climate emergency and the ecological emergency. Um, as I'm sure many of the people on the call, perhaps all of us, recognise we're running out of time and it's a very difficult uh, challenge that we face to be able to uh, work within regulations and work within natural human timescales but at the same time recognising there is an emergency and that there are things that we could be doing now that cost very little and would actually and don't require much management that could uh, that could help us speed things up. We're firm believers in a, a catchment based approach and a whole systems approach and we, we work in collaboration through networks so we are small and we will stay small. Um, we are, uh, we are very keen to work with existing techniques, so natural flood management, riparian planting, buns that was mentioned originally in the, in the first talk. Um, but also I've emphasised the N here, you know, natural flood management without actual nature uh, isn't necessarily all the way we could be going with natural flood management. So is there a way we could transition to those leaky dams to be perhaps dams that are put in place by beavers and managed by beavers with our help? Uh, we have set up an international alliance called Beavers Without Borders uh, to support communities and we work with government to inform policies and to drive the national strategy with a partnership of NGOs. Our job is to convene stakeholders and to align the interests of farmers, riverkeepers, foresters, conservationists and so on. And we work practically in the field by supporting community nature restoration projects. We're looking at about 40 or so at the moment and they are a combination of enclosures, but we hope very much to move much more to wild releases when policy changes, we hope later this year. And we also do a lot of education and communications more and more so. And our vision is that Britain's waterways and landscapes will be, uh, will see the normalising, and we put it in inverted commas, uh, of beavers and that we will rapidly re-establish beaver wetlands where they're appropriate. So what's the challenge? Um, we know about the climate extinction emergency. We have a 25 year uh, uh, environment plan, but where are the teeth? What are we going to do uh, in addition to current plans that we can actually speed things up? We have huge costs that you can see there. We are, our properties are at risk. Unfortunately, as we all know, we're underperforming as a nation compared to pretty much most other nations in the world. We rank 189th out of 218 for complete, uh, for, for our, our, our state of nature. Uh, we're missing many of our environmental targets. Our soil is washing off to the sea. It's quite a depressing list here, I'm afraid to say. Um, and the costs of things like soil degradation and floods are, are, are huge. Um, we believe we can do quite a lot of that, um, but only if we work, as I say at the bottom there, the, the, the sustainable, uh, we need to sustainably manage our land. But at the moment, the, the, the things have been cut, funding has been cut and the amount of land has reduced. So um, we're somewhat up against it. Why beavers and why rivers? Well, there are 300,000 kilometres of rivers and uh, they cross borders, they cross mindsets, they cross communities, but only 14% of them are in good health. Many of them are in permanent drought. You look at chalk streams north of London, uh, I think only 25% of current average rainfall according to and flow according to, uh, uh, according to the Rivers Trust and obviously action being a big issue, but there's also a lot of other issues that cause these things, not least climate change. And we see this as perhaps being a way of being a nature recovery network along with hedgerows and other ways. And, and you, you, after all, you can't plow a river. The environmental land management schemes that are being developed are ones that we completely back. The idea of rewarding ecological stewardship and measuring it and, and, and um, incentivizing to bring in the flood budget and other things and um, to change the way we farm along uh, our rivers and creating buffers where beavers and other organisms uh, can flourish. Um, the, uh, the EA themselves have said that there are very considerable financial benefits uh, that could be done by restoring our rivers and ultimately we believe we need our, all our community members, river keepers, water utilities, foresters to work together. Beaver history 
for a long time. Uh, we co-evolved with a huge native beaver population across the Northern Hemisphere. There are about a hundred or sorry, 600 million across the whole of the Northern, the Northern Hemisphere. And it's fair to say as an archeologist, I would say we are, our civilization emerged alongside and often in beaver wetlands. Uh, if you look at our structures that we've used over the years, many of the buildings uh, replicate not just birds' nests and moving, uh, 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 combining mud and sticks, uh, but also beavers do that with their lodges and their dams. They uh, perhaps, and other animals showed us how to coppice. Uh, they certainly showed us how to manage water. <laughs> There's also lots of evidence. Um, the River Parrot in the, in the south, the Kennet, the Thames and so on. Uh, beavers have been around a long time and with human populations. However, they taste good. Their fur keeps us warm. Their castorium, the uh, secretion from a gland, is a wonderful uh, uh, form of pain relief because of willow bark they eat. And bizarrely, it smells nice. Uh, beavers were hunted to extinction in Britain probably by around 1600, maybe a little bit later. And beavers actually funded our economy when we moved west as, a, as western europeans into north america um, we we expanded west through the hudson bay company and others uh, by selling beaver pelts it was an extraordinary uh, feat of economics and also nature degradation so the irony is that beavers are in our historic place names our family names our art they're in our history but they aren't any longer in our in our culture they're returning at rapid levels in europe and as you can see here, populations now heading up towards one and a quarter million when they were only down to about a thousand not that long ago. Um, in Britain, we're probably somewhere between 800 and a thousand, maybe, maybe a bit less. Um, but tragically, we've, you may have read only this, this week, a hundred were killed in, beef, in Scotland under government license. Um, and, and a lot of that's probably, uh, as we understand it, because of a lack of information and education awareness and a lack of support, not malicious uh, behavior, just people not really knowing what to do when they feel their crop are threatened. So in Britain today, we've had many years of trials, the River Otter Beaver Trial, uh, there's a lady from the Wildlife Trust on the call today, um, led, uh, led that, uh, a, a fantastic effort and other trials have demonstrated the many, many benefits that outweigh the costs of beavers and there is a, a considerable body of evidence that expands across uh, that northern hemisphere that I've just mentioned. Beaver, the beavers themselves can cause challenges and they can be managed. And Chris will talk to you a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, we believe that to normalize them as a native species, we will reap the benefits across our wetlands. And many of the things that have been talked about today could possibly be augmented by beavers. But as I said earlier, not everywhere necessarily. So imagine what we could do with just a tiny fraction of our flood budget. There are billions of billions of pounds that are spent on water management and, and land management this year. For just a few million over a few years, we have a wonderful animal return as an ecosystem engineer. I'd like to hand over to Chris. Thank you, James. Uh, just give me a second to tee up the, uh, whatchamacallit here. Okay, here it is, uh, a few of the uh, practical considerations about these animals. Um, I'm going to really rattle through this because I know time is short and we need questions, really. One of the very few real keystone species that there are, this does change things dramatically. Um, it's a big animal, up to 25 to 30 kilos and a real big one. Herbivorous, other nature thrives alongside them. Uh, quite a, uh, an interesting uh, social life that they have, and that dramatically uh, uh, affects the, their, their, uh, their um, uh, work out in the environment. Highly territorial. They will kill each other over territory, but we can use that to a to, uh, good effect. They're like us, they are very lazy. They don't want to do any work at all if they don't have to, um, apart from dig a burrow. So where they want to be really is uh, in your context, probably in um, uh, the River Ten, somewhere down uh, near Richmond. 
uh, where they don't have to build a dam, they just have to borrow into a bank. But of course, because they're highly territorial, they will slowly, slowly push up river systems until the water gets so shallow, they have to start building dams and that's where the magic happens. They create wetlands far, far better than any other agent that I can think of, including us. Okay, opportunities. Some of these we don't even need to talk about. Um, I, I saw a place in Germany uh, two years ago where they actually cut the cost of flood management uh, by two thirds just because some beavers moved in above their little village. That's real taxpayers' money to help real taxpayers. They catch an awful lot of agricultural pollutants uh, and they're brilliant for drought resilience. Absolutely superb. In 2018, uh, on the farm here, we managed to irrigate pasture uh, from our beaver dams because we had something we didn't have before, which was a reserve of water. Uh, fish numbers uh, and size increase in headwaters. Uh, I was quite taken with the comments about removing fish barriers. Um, I, I would uh, aver that we need fish barriers, not remove them. They are critical to us and we need to learn to live with another decision maker uh, on our land. Okay, uh, just one of the um, benefits of this is in ecotourism, for example, and we run a, a, a number of educational and private visits to the farm and it just shows in, we don't worry about any of the details on this, but a steady increase since we uh, ha had these animals arrive. Right, just to show how quickly they work, they were released on June the 16th, 2017. And this is what happened on, from June the 18th of the next week. So within a week, they produced a, a creditable dam. What you can't see is there were two outflows on this pond and they also dammed the other one uh, uh, in the same manner. So uh, in an incredibly short space of time, they banked up several hundred cubic meters of water. So three years on, our little site, and it's tiny, this site's just over five acres, 200 meters of stream. Hardly at any point saying too much about this because you can all read. Critically from the uh, uh, biodiversity point of view, they are attracting, or rather the landscape they're creating is attracting a whole bunch of new birds and mammals uh, and the new plants and insects and amphibians turning up as well. It is really, really exciting. Okay, just a quick gallop through some hydrographs. This is before the beavers arrived, um, and you can see a, a red line and a blue line. Uh, the red line is the water leaving the site, the blue line is the water entering the site. <clears throat> the uh, peaks are virtually simultaneous, and the water leaving the site always higher than that entering, always. We had quite a dry summer when they were let go there and we had 10 weeks without any significant rain. Then we had a, a, a decent Atlantic depression come through and in 10 weeks they had built four dams and that is the result. Uh, an incredible drop in the flood peak and considerable attenuation of the, of the, uh, of the flow. So in other words what they're doing is, is, uh, is creating um, or repairing, if you like, a water battery. Beforehand, the site could charge up really, really fast, but discharge just as slowly. Now, the site is, uh, is acting as if the battery is being fixed. Right, it charges up just as quickly, but it is beginning to just discharge a lot more slowly. We're returning ecological function to our streams. And I would aver uh, that, um, yes, we can have ecological, uh, according to WFD type uh, um, rules, we can have ecological uh, fitness in rivers and streams, but real ecology actually demands these animals back if we're gonna make the, the kind of change that we really wish to see. This couple of um, quick pictures, this was before the bees arrived. 
and here was uh, just before the COVID-19 shutdown, so 20th of March. Uh, just check out my wetland. And this could happen anywhere. And I was really impressed with the, um, some of the NFM work that was being displayed earlier. Uh, these guys will do it better and uh, uh, they, they will do it in, in, a, in a way that is going to cost us actually very, very, very little. Challenges. We do get challenges. We can't, we can't be sentimental about them. We can't, we can't brush over the challenges. Um, they cut down trees. They regrow. And it is really easy to protect trees if we want to. So you could say that losing a tree to a beaver is a voluntary act by us. They create flooding. Uh, but if that flooding is in a, a, a helpful place, that can be incredibly useful to us. They can damage some crops too. Um, we have uh, proposed uh, with the elms uh, thing, but it doesn't have to be that. It could be lots of other ways of doing it. We should actually have going forward uh, river margins or river buffers in place. Uh, we reckon 20 metres would just about cover it um, across the country. Why not? If they get too deep or the, the, spot, the, the uh, dam spread too much and it's a place where we can't tolerate that, it's really easy to control that, uh, that spread of water by just introducing flood, uh, by reintroducing flow devices. Really easy to protect. You know, uh, we make quite heavy weather of this. All of this has been done in North America and Europe uh, they're really basic, easy techniques. We could train people to do this in just two or three days. Very, very simple to do. They love things like carrots and spuds and maize. So we might have to protect with uh, either the, the crops back away from the river or using uh, very simple electric fences. They'll damage flood banks for sure. So, in the, um, the Tayside context, they've got some uh, floodplain agriculture there, which is getting smacked by, by uh, beavers uh, burrowing to flood banks. That is preventable. Uh, two ways of doing it. One is just removing beavers from there, which is part of what the, uh, the shooting is about, although that's uh, given the context of, of, of such a low population in the country, that seems uh, wasteful in the extreme. But also, you can protect flood banks as they have in, in Germany in the Danube floodplain with uh, a steel mesh and so on let into, uh, let into flood banks. And I think that these points here are just about ready for James to go and carry on with. Thank you very much. Hi everybody. I'll just quickly get back on the screen. While James is doing that, uh, one or two of you are putting questions th through, so do keep doing that at this stage, and we'll we've got a couple already, um, and we'll come back to those in in very shortly once James has finished. Great. Well, I'm just going to quickly wrap up. Um, in the work that we're doing to support communities, we have started a regional program in uh, Cornwall, as you can see here. Uh, Chris convened a summit very recently, and this is actually during the lockdown. We, sorry, we haven't got your slide up at the moment, the correct slide. Ah, it says I'm screen sharing. Uh, Chris, maybe Chris... Oh, uh, yes, I'm oh. sorry, beg your pardon, here we go. Is that working now? I've got it. I can see it, James. Yep. Is that everybody? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, despite the lockdown, we're still able to do a lot of work. Um, I'm sure lots of you can say the same. It's very frustrating. We can't get out into the field to support communities at the moment. But bizarrely, we've actually been able to do quite a lot on the policy side and advocacy on comms and, uh, and also engaging and bringing communities together. Chris convened a Cornwall Beaver Summit uh, just a couple of weeks ago where 50 people joined us from government, from local authorities and uh, conservation groups, landowners and so on. 
And the idea being that we would help align those interests, listen, share, and uh, just as you guys are doing today with your uh, catchment partnerships, and to see if there's ideas that could be uh, built upon. And perhaps if people feel that there's a need for uh, beaver wetlands, in our particular case, and our interest area, then we could join up and form a strategy for that region, or in this case, a county. And so um, we're, we are, we're finding that we, are, uh, we hear all sorts of different opinions. Um, you can see here we have uh, a fishing guide, um, who uh, based in Scotland, Duncan Pepper, who is uh, subtle in the way he communicates in that he will say things like, um, if you, if you, if, if you, if he tends to notice that there's a lot of woody debris around a beaver lodge and therefore a safe haven for, uh, uh, for, for invertebrates that feed the fish. He won't just say, I catch big fish, which is, which happens to be the case when he fishes in, in, uh, in, 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 in areas where beavers exist. Uh, con uh, contrary to that, there are organisations that don't wholly agree with that, but may go part way. And then I haven't put a quote here, but there will be some who are quite resistant to, uh, to a new species returning, especially when they're highly disruptive as a beaver is. Uh, there's a very complicated policy landscape, as one could probably imagine. Um, uh, Graham has been very, very, we've had some very interesting conversations with Graham uh, from the Environment Agency's point of view. They're a consultee on licenses for beavers. Um, Natural England are the license issuers, as you probably know, and obviously this is all within the auspices of DEFRA. Uh, bizarrely, uh, despite all the tests and trials that have been done and beavers being protected in Scotland, England and Wales, they're still not recognised as a native species. They are a red list endangered species with a mammal society um, and they are recognised as native across most of the northern hemisphere. Under the EU Habitats Directive, we're required to protect them. Um, and uh, although they're not a dangerous animal or on that list, they are required for a license on an enclosure. You could have a capybara or a porcupine, which can be quite dangerous at your home without a license. You cannot have a beaver. Beavers are the only rodent that require a license. And um, unfortunately, because of the current situation that we're in, farmers and landowners and officials and some of the people on this call, uh, Blenheim uh, Estate, the, the Wildlife Trust, have gone through or are going through a very costly and time-consuming uh, time process to, uh, to allow beavers to even exist within, a, within an enclosure. Uh, we are seeing transition though. The Natural England seem to be broadly supportive of the uh, change uh, where we can encourage wild releases and do it in a very measured and considered approach. Chris has mentioned that there's plenty of management techniques that have been tested around the world that we can learn from and use, even those that have been done in Britain. Um, and so any barriers that are there, we think we can overcome, but with the emphasis that it has to be community led. If we're going to see these animals back in our landscapes, communities need to want them and that people need to learn to live how to, uh, relearn how to live with them. The River Otter Beaver Trial done by the Wildlife Trust has proven brilliantly that much of this is the case and has raised concerns that we should be tackling and uh, we can learn from uh, places like Scotland on the legislation point of view. Um, the lethal control licenses that are in existence now are, we think is a, is, a, is a sadness and unnecessary because we can translocate even if beavers are just you know causing considerable disruption in a place. So if we look in Bavaria in, uh, in Germany uh, we see a 12 million population of people and a 23,000 population of beavers. Uh, they coexist, uh, they have a, a, a simple management process where rivers are allowed to breathe, which is something we advocate for and we're, we're, constant, we're talking to government about so that we have a 10 or 20 metre buffer along a river uh, and it makes sure that there's less chance for uh, farmland particularly to conflict with with beaver land. Uh, there are plenty of management way, uh, ways of dealing with things and, uh, and they have, uh, have proven there that by having local support with a centralised governance system behind it all, it works. They have beaver consultants supporting the local regions too. Uh, we've seen in Britain that demand is clear. Uh, even 53% of farmers and fishers two or three years ago when consulted um, out of, a, there were many, many hundreds consulted, uh, were pro beaver or at least understood the benefits of them and were willing to try and coexist with them. Uh, we've all seen plenty of media coverage recently, uh, the National Trust, the Wildlife Trust and so on and other organisations. We, we recently signed a letter or wrote a letter and had it signed by over 60 NGOs, including the, the organisations I've just mentioned, that we sent to government to encourage them to speed up the process, um, uh, demonstrating uh, many, many organisations, landowners and so on, saying they want to have them back. There are the ecotourism benefits. They clean our land. They supply water. They increase black, uh, habitats for pollinators. There are fishing opportunities. You can see the list there. There are a lot of things these animals can do. And we think it's a really good opportunity for a good news story when we desperately need them not just in the face of climate change and extinction, uh, biodiversity uh, depletion, but also for us as humans and our well-being. 
So we're developing a national strategy. Uh, we welcome talking to you guys, anybody about this. Um, there's already a lot of work done by the Wildlife Trust, particularly on the management side of this particularly. There are some gaps, for example, on translocation and supply, and we're working with the Wildlife Trust and others uh, on a working group, and we'll be presenting our, our joined up efforts to government in the coming weeks. Um, if anyone's interested to, uh, to talk to us, then we, we may be able to help you go from the all the great work you've done so far to maybe consider bringing beavers, if you haven't already, into the work you're doing, and we're, we're here to help. Thank you very much indeed for listening to us both. We're very sorry it's had to be so rushed. We normally don't talk this quickly <laughs> and uh, very much encourage questions, but that, hopefully that will come now. Thank you very much.